Testing, testing, testing. Testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Test. Hello. How's it going?
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hello. All right, much better, much better. A little, a little weak still. I'm Jose Santa Maria, the museum director. Very, very good to see everybody today. Uh, looking forward to our speaker. Uh, a couple of things, a little housekeeping things, of course, as you all know, if you have one of these, let's make it quiet. We don't want to annoy our speaker. Uh, and uh, we do have surveys on the table, so even if you're seated over here, please uh, give us feedback on how, what you think about our programs. We, we uh, continuously learn, and we like to come up, come up with, uh, with new ideas. A couple of things coming up, very exciting, very, very exciting. A week from Friday, uh, we have a reception opening our new Meteorite exhibit, Meteorite Headlines. Uh, this is an exhibit featuring meteorites that have hit our things, that have hit animals, and have hit people. Uh, pretty exciting, including a car whose uh, rear trunk got smashed by a meteorite about 25 years ago. Pretty cool, huh? It's going to be here on exhibit. Uh, pretty neat. Uh, a couple of Saturdays from now, we have heavy metal in motion. That's when we bring in fire trucks and helicopters and, and uh, earth diggers and ambulances, all kinds of cool vehicles. And uh, most of those, you can actually get inside and get your picture taken and honk the horn on a tractor trailer. How cool is that? That's October, uh, October 13th. Um, so now I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker. It's a, a real delight uh, to introduce our curator. Ryan Roney. Ryan has been here uh, uh, a little over se six months. He is the seventh curator in the history of museums here, not just TELUS, but the Wyman Mineral Museum. So there's been a museum here for 35 years, and uh, 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 Ryan just is uh, the, the latest in a long least list of distinguished uh, curators, plus me. I was a curator at one time, too. Uh, but uh, Ryan, uh, native of uh, Idaho, but he grew up in Atlanta. He and I share uh, a couple of things. Uh, we have a, a, a passion for geology. We both speak Spanish. And we went to the same high school, although not together. Uh, I'm younger than he is. He, uh, uh, he uh, got his uh, undergraduate at, uh, to, uh, undergraduate at uh, West Georgia and the uh, uh, Georgia Southwestern University. His master's at the University of Tennessee, where he's working towards his PhD, so that he'll be uh, soon uh, Dr. Roney. He lives uh, here in Carsville with his wife, Natasha, two boys and a baby girl. And uh, when he's not working, on, uh, working with rocks, he's playing with kids, uh, building Legos, and teaching them music. So let's give a warm welcome to our curator, Ryan Roney. Thank you for that introduction, Jose. It's a pleasure to be here today. So today the question starts off like one of those electronic games that you may have played, the, the 20 questions, animal, vegetable, or mineral. Well, in fact, the history of all of those things is combined. And today we're going to actually do kind of a walk through time. These numbers here right now, as we get started, are going to represent billions of years in history, and later on, it'll change to hundreds of millions. But we're going to walk through time today. Um, but the history of life and of this planet we find in the rock record. So um, fossils in the rock, chemicals left by um, various processes that happen in the earth or by the animals and plants that have lived, those get left in the rock. Um, the concept of time that we, as we know it and the deep time actually comes from observations made in Scotland in the late 1700s at this location called Sicker Point. A guy who had studied how, much, how, how the sand, or the sediments left his own property um, and he figured out that it would take time for all of that to settle, saw these layers that are sideways and other layers on top and realized that a lot of time had to happen for that to be deposited, for that to be raised up, for that to be lifted, eroded, and put back down to have more deposited on it. And then other observations of animal life and fossils on the different continents started to indicate to us that maybe the continents have moved. So if we go back in time using this record that the rocks have told us, we can go back to the history of our planet and all the different things that have happened to life and to the rocks as we go further and further back in time. And then beyond the rocks and the record that we get from meteorites, we actually have other records that we can get from looking at stars 
and even back deep into time in the galaxy, and we see the origin of everything that makes mineral and life. So I'm stepping back today to the Big Bang. So actually, five billion years here, add another 8.8 .8 billion years to 13.8 billion years ago when everything originated. We need to think from that point because that, in that process, very quickly, the first stars formed and they produced these elements. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. Hydrogen is a big part of what makes up life. But also, as we made further minerals in the, in the first few stars, we began to have these elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. That's the other, part, other elements that make up life. So in the earliest stars, we had the material that was necessary for life. And then with supernova, as these stars use up their energy and, and produce the first elements up to, up to iron, we then get to produce all of the other elements that we need. Now, of course, on this chart, the stuff in brown, that's the stuff that we make as humans as we experiment with, uh, with things. But naturally occurring, we need the stars. We need the supernova. But then, a supernova, 4.6 billion years ago, so right about here in time, that is where our sun comes from. And when that happened, we also have the elements that make up everything that we have on our planet. And we began to have, around that sun, protoplanetary. This is the protoplanetary disk. This is where the planets start to form, and you differentiate between the planets that we have, the gaseous and the Earth-like, you know, terrestrial planets. Earth puts it, gets together and coalesces as a planet 4.54 billion years ago. We eventually, everything comes together and we start to have a basaltic crust on the surface of that planet. We get water on that planet. The water comes from outgassing, potentially, from volcanics, but also brought in from comets, other material that was part of that initial protoplanetary uh, disk. The moon forms in a violet collision with some other um, um, body, and, and that's where we trap what was left be our moon. Do we have life on this planet? Not yet. It's pretty violent. And in fact, we don't have a lot of the rocks from that time period, but the rocks and the remnants of rocks that we have on the planet today are from 4 billion years ago with some grains in some sandstone in Australia from 4.4 billion years ago. So all of our knowledge about what just happened up to this point comes from meteorites, bits and pieces from that process that have eventually settled onto our planet when they collide. And so here we have this history and this record of, of, our, of our planet, and we see this record through um, radiometric age dating. That's using the isotopes in there, those radioactive isotopes that break down. And so you have the parent, once it's sealed in, that crystal, especially these zircons here, these little zircons here, that crystal seals in a history of when, when that was formed. And so that lets us know about this history of our planet. Do we have life yet? Probably not. But here we have, at this time period, we're still getting bombarded with things. A lot of, we're, 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 in, a, we're in a messy um, solar system. There's lots of meteorites and other things other bodies floating around. And so this is the late heavy bombardment. Our first evidence of life actually comes chemically at about 3.8 billion years. I'm inching forward here. Now one of the things that's confusing about this is we think of when did life form and how did we get life on this planet is, well first off, let me pause here. This is, a, this is going to be the tree of life and we're gonna fill this in as we go through the talk today. Right now, I've got nothing on there. You see the names on the side? Those are the groups that we're going to eventually have. But first life is thought to have come up about this time, as that bombardment ends. You think life could have come up as everything's being hit by meteorites, destroyed, frequently surface being recycled like that? Probably not, but this is where it gets confusing. Recent papers that have come out tell us that life might have been even older than 3.8 and 4.1. The thing called the uh, molecular clock calculates life at 4.5 billion years. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the implications of that calculation 
But first, where does life even come from? A number of theories have come about that they interactions on the on the on the surface of clays. Clays have a charge on their surface, that flat surface. Maybe the um, proteins and other forms developed into life there. Um, maybe comets brought them in, or maybe the life molecules that we see from life, ammonia, other things, brought in with that. Maybe in a warm young sea, but that takes later because we need oceans. Those are a little later. Or maybe at volcanic sea vents. That's where life occurred. So up to this point, we've actually built these different spheres. And this is kind of an Earth systems theory look at, the, at, our, at our planet. So we have the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the lithosphere, um, the hydrosphere, all these different things. This is water, this is the land, this is the air. These are the things that life needs. So life finds a way, however it did, and we have this ancestor to all life. It came up about this time period, or maybe even a little bit further back. Well, We'll continue to look for the research on exactly when and exactly how, but that's where we are in, the, in this time period. Now, the actual fossils of life, we start finding microbial mats, and at 3.1 billion years ago, we have stromatolites. Stromatolites are actual layers of, of, live, of life. These are these um, single-celled organisms. They, they create these mats. They actually produce a slime, so they go together, um, and, in fa and then sediment can collect on them, and then more layers grow on top, and in time, you end up with these structures that get preserved in the rock record, and that's what we see. And, there's, and this, is, this image that we have here today, or on here, is actually some stromatolites that grow off the coast of Australia. So we still have stromatolites in some very special localities living today. But these stromatolites and other single-celled organisms in the, in the water, that was life. That was the tree of life at that time. And in fact, as we continue through the next billion years, life is single-celled, and we lead up to the Great Oxidation event. So at this point, life has been producing, as life be, interacts with the world, it, it actually creates oxygen. So these cells are creating oxygen, and that oxygen in the atmosphere starts to make changes on our planet. Now, there's a lot of sediment coming off of, these, off of the continents into the, into the oceans, and that, those sediments interact with the oxygen that's in the air. So as oxygen builds up, that oxygen gets used and gets trapped. So do you see these rocks? They're banded. Low oxygen in the black, high oxygen in the red. So this iron, these banded iron formations are a record of that fluctuating oxygen in our atmosphere. So as life builds up, we have evidence of those interactions in the rocks. So look back, look at this picture. So as th this was, so here we come through, this was our planet. Here's this time period with the stromatolites. And as we have this interaction with oxygen, oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that begins to affect the climate. So we actually allow the, the planet to get colder, and we have our first instance of a snowball Earth. Not just glaciers on the poles, but the entire planet covered in ice. So like a slush ball, our planet, a you know, big slush ball floating in space. And so life builds up a bit more, and we actually, at 1.8 billion years, developed the first eukaryote. Eukaryotes are the single-celled organisms that lead to multicellular life. So to have the big animals and to have us, we need the eukaryotes to have developed. And so they evolve at this point. This is a combination of different groups to have cell bodies inside the cell of another of, a, of another single-celled organism. So the combined powers of, of both of these two groups in one unit. And so the first eukaryotes do, uh, evolve, and so that's the symbiosis here, I mean, between the eubacteria and the archaeobacteria, 
And so we have eukaryotes, which eventually lead to us. So now, we've had a billion years of single-celled life. We have another billion years of single-celled life. Um, frequently by geologists, it's called the boring billion, because nothing's happening. So we've had two billion years of life on our planet, and all they're doing is just cranking out oxygen, using up the carbon dioxide, d developing photosynthesis, and, but they're just floating around and interacting, and some the eukaryotes are the beginning of, are, are a result of possibly predation between these single-celled organisms that are flitting about, because that's where you end up with a cell inside another cell, and, and rather than eating it, uh, maybe was doing photosynthesis or providing other energy. Mitochondria is the energy um, part of our cell. So that's where we are. But the boring billion ends, and we have another time period of glaciation and, a, and actually two periods of snowball earth that happen. And it is in this time period that we then come up to the Ediacaran fauna. These, are, these fossils can be found in Australia. These are the first big macroscopic life. Macro meaning large, micro, tiny. These are phrases that I hope you, your kids know. So the Ediacaran fauna look weird. They look different than anything that we see today. But all of the groups in the Ediacaran fauna are actually the beginnings of a lot of the phyla that we have today. A lot of the groups that are alive today can be linked back to these fauna. And so that, that's the chart. This year, our, our tree of life is getting a little bit bigger. And this guy here, Dickinsonia, is, is one of those Ediacaran fauna. And it was just in the news just last week. They, they were able to get out of the rock evidence of cholesterols or fats in that rock. So that's evidence of the earliest that these were not plants, that's the other question, are these Ediacaran actually fauna, or are they um, flora? So are they animal or plant? That was always a question. Definitively, certainly now, after this study, these are animals. And these are the oldest known animals in the history of our planet. So this is also a good point. Here the continents are coming together, forming a supercontinent called Rodinia or actually they're now breaking apart from Rodinia. Um, but I've walked this far in time, and I want to take this last 500 or so million years, and let's now expand it back to this whole timeline. All right? So that five now becomes 500 million. It was five billion, but this is now 500 million. So here we are now, just past 500 million years ago, at 540 million years ago, we're at the Cambrian. Within the Cambrian, we have what's called the Cambrian Explosion. Now, up to this point, it's the Proterozoic is the time period that's called. That word means the beginning of life. Entering into the Cambrian, we are entering the time period we call the Phanerozoic, or visible life. And that means that in the rock record, we can see these animals. So what happens at the time of the Cambrian explosion is we have biomineralization. Did you know that you have minerals in your body? One of them is your skeleton. You look at your skeleton every day when you brush your teeth. You realize that? That's part of your skeleton exposed. Those are minerals. And so... Animals at this time began to use the minerals that were in the water to make skeletons, exoskeletons. Well, we don't have an endoskeleton yet, but we have exoskeletons. We have shells. We have snails with um, magnetite teeth. They're using iron to make their teeth. You know, these, and even today. But these, all these different minerals used out of the water is it because there were so many minerals in the water and it was toxic and the animals just needed to do something with them? Or was it because they were having so much predation and they needed to have tools to protect themselves or to be better at hunting? One or the other, or a little bit of both. This is what happens as, as life evolves and interacts. And so here we have this moment, this Cambrian explosion, and this explosion of life 
expands all the different groups that we have on the planet. A lot of the groups that we have today that were represented in the um, Ediacaran fauna, we now have firmly in the fossil record at the Cambrian. And so we see all these groups, the arthropods, the echinoderms, and, and, all the, and um, Ryozoan, and all these other groups come in to this time period. Here we have the continents moving, some of them moving further north to the, the equator, coming into the Ordovician. That's a lot of warm water and a lot of space for things to grow. We actually have, go from the Cambrian explosion to the Ordovician radiation. Life during the Ordovician expands. In fact, here's a history. Of, this is a list of all the, the numbers of, of genera or, or groups of animals in the oceans throughout time. So this is marine life. In the Cambrian, we see that jump right there at that arrow. But you see how much bigger that jump is through the Ordovician? That's a much bigger increase, that radiation. So we had all those groups show up in the Cambrian, but in the Ordovician, all those groups went out and explored everything. Here's some fireworks show. So it's like the, that initial burst, the rocket that's sent up when you're at the fireworks show, that was the Cambrian. But the real bang is here with the Ordovician. As everything goes through and expands through all of the different, what we call morphospaces, that's the different body plans and shapes that they can, that they can use to try and compete for food and for survival. So we now enter into this time period where we have even more of the groups, and the groups that didn't show up in the Cambrian that we have today are now here after this radiation. So do you see that explosion right there? How much built up? I'll go back to one. Bam. Just a lot of life, a lot of different things. It's an incredible time period to study, and a lot that we can see in the, in the fossil record from this time period. So continuing on through the late Ordovician, we end up at our first mass extinction. What is a mass extinction? It's when a large percentage of life dies out. There's lots of different causes for that. The mass extinction here is probably because of some climate change. Things got cold, you, sea level changes, you lose some, some continental sh shelf area, so competition gets a little more fierce. And so that's the first of the major mass extinctions in the Phanerozoic. So continuing through time into the Silurian, we have a few different groups changing around, different innovations. Big thing that happens in the Silurian, plant life begins to make its way onto land. Starts with the, with the moss, starts with a few things that, that don't have roots, but eventually roots develop and you start having changes in our landscape. In fact, things with roots make the ocean, I mean, make, the, make the rivers be able to form meanders because the roots hold the, the mud together. You used to have braided streams and now we have the big meandering streams coming in at this time. And as plant life comes onto land, we start to have insects working their way onto land. Don't have vertebrates yet. They're, 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 not even on the, they're not even on the scene yet, but they're going to be the next group to try to get onto land. But we have the plants and the insects and, and other arthropods on land. So we continue into the Devonian. So here we're at 400. I'm walking a little too far. We're still 400. We're at 370. Um, these names of orogenies that I have on here, those are the mountain building events that built the Appalachian Mountains. So all the way from New York and Maine, all the way down to, to Georgia, and even into to Mexico. And in fact, part of the Appalachians in the north is here in Acadia, that's Nova Scotia, and even Scotland and parts of Norway. That was all part of the same mountain chain. So as you see these names, that's the building up of those mountains that you now know today. Um, the Devonian is, the, is called the Age of Fishes. We go from jawless fish to fish with jaws. We start getting sharks. We have um, bony finned fish. And as we come through the Devonian, we end up getting to the fish that decide to experiment with what's on land. It's a lot of competition down in the water. Insects and other things have started to make their way onto land. It means there's plenty of food for the brave fish who wants to crawl out on land, and there's some fish who have 
air bladders that they can use like lungs and eventually evolve. And a few have some, have some the bony fins versus the ray fins. And so they actually have the ability to support their weight onto land and they crawl up onto land. And we have the beginning of more innovation. Life finds a way. Life competes. Life, life has the niches that it tries to go for. And it, there's so, so much going on. Now, we come through the Devonian and we have yet another mass extinction. But you see that dip is not that big, it's smaller. There's a little changeover. changeover. Well, these mass extinctions are largely how we got the, we, we recognize the changeover in fauna is why we changed the name of these time periods. All these names, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, that we talk about, if any of you know your, your British history and British geography, you'll recognize that these are places or former tribes of people that lived in areas in England. That's all this is, is we see the fossils change through time. This is where the rock record gives us this story. So these extinction events give us a point in time as we see a change in the fauna. That's why we've changed these names in the history. So continuing into the Mississippian. Oh, now we're at geography in the States. So something's going on that was big enough to see in the pattern of the rocks that we name it for an area where we see that, obviously. And so the Mississippian, a lot of plant life, a lot of life on land, and again, we have innovation going on in the sea and on land. Large ferns, even fern trees, we have these, the, we start to develop wood, so we get to really tall trees. We've life, you know, plants before didn't get much taller than you or I, but once you get wood, you can send, you, you can grow. How big is a redwood today? There are trees similar in height back then. So, and then all of that gets preserved in the Mississippian and into the. Uh, the Pennsylvanian, which together globally is called the Carboniferous, as coal. That carbon that gets preserved in those plants, that coal, that's all the plants pulling carbon dioxide out of the air as they die and collect in the swamps, because there's changing sea levels. So a lot of these, you build up a lot of swamps and a lot of um, preservation of these plants, we actually change the climate. So through the Carboniferous, our planet actually gets cooler because the carbon is being stored. And see, fungus is around, but it hadn't yet developed the ability to, to, to digest and break down lignin. That's the part that makes wood, wood. And so without that being digested by anything that's alive at the time, a lot of wood is preserved. A lot of that carbon is trapped and sequestered or taken out of the atmosphere. So here we have this lowering of temperature and this change in our climate caused by life. One of the other things that happens at this time is we start to have the innovation of flight. Now, mammals don't fly yet and reptiles don't fly yet, but we have insects. Five or six different insect groups all figure out how to fly in different ways and on their own. Um, and, I, and later on, we'll talk about when the reptiles and the mammals were flying. So, we are so still at, we are at the Pennsylvanian, and we continue through to the early Permian, the Allegheny and Orogeny, so the continued buildup of the Appalachian Mountains. And we're entering in the time period where we have large synapsids, which is a group that broke off from the reptiles, that become the dominant predators on land. Synapsids are the group that eventually leads to mammals. Um, so here we had this big group here, um, continuing, this is our continent, they're shifting, they're coming together to make Pangaea, and here's some more synapsids here, the other, um, it has a temnospondyl um, amphibian in its mouth there, it's, so we have large amphibians, large synapsids, there are reptiles around, but at this time period, reptiles are small, they eat insects, and they're not the dominant organisms here. So our tree of life is filling up. We're having lots of different things. And now we enter the big extinction, 
of everything. Life itself on this planet almost went extinct. Not just a lot of things went extinct, it almost went completely. 96, maybe even as much as 99% of all of the species on our planet went extinct at the end Permian extinction. A lot of things combined, changes in the climate, changes in sea level, um, volcanic traps putting lots of gases into the atmosphere that changed the climate, it got hot, and bolide impacts, um, big meteorites. All of these things coming together at this time period, changing everything, largely the volcanic cause at this point is the reason for the end Permian extinction. But all of these changes led to almost nothing making it through. One or two species in some groups was all that we have a record of having survived. And from those species, the innovation and diversification that evolved afterwards came from those groups. So we make it through there and into the Middle Triassic. We have one large continent, big deserts, because when you have that large a, a land mass, it takes a lot for the, for the water to make it from the oceans inland. So you end up with large deserts. So it's a hot, there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. And this is the time period where we get our switch over from the synapsids ruling things to the dinosaurs. Archosaurs, a group of reptiles that leads to our crocodiles, leads to pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, leads to um, dinosaurs. This is the time period where they rise up as now the dominant predators, as the largest animals, and in fact begin to develop into the bigger groups. This is also a time period where some reptiles, as very large organisms, return to the sea. They go, and so this is the first return. So animals that had left the sea and, and evolved as land organisms, dealing with all of the issues that living on land presents, now decide to scrap all that and go back to the ocean. They saw an opportunity. And so we have a lot of those um, awesomely large um, reptiles that Mary Anning found on the beaches in England and she collected as a kid. So that's in this, um, in this time period here. See, it's all, all through the Triassic, Jurassic, and into the Cretaceous, it's all reptiles. As we come into the Cretaceous, we'll get some birds, and it's not until after <coughs> the end Cretaceous extinction that mammals begin to explore a return back to the ocean. So, continuing through the late Triassic, the, the, the Pangaea is still a thing. We're not yet broken apart. Dinosaurs are in charge, and here is our tree of life. A lot of diversity on our planet. Now, life is everywhere in the oceans and in the land, and, and digging deep in the, in the substrate, flying in the air. Um, in fact, as we come into the, come, and right here is a, a minor extinction that happens in the Triassic part of that changeover in fauna. And then the Jurassic is when the continents start to break apart. So all these groups before that were on the, on the different continents were all the same around the world. You find different fossils in Africa and South America and China and in North America and you have a lot of the same things. But as Pangaea breaks apart, we now have localized diversification as, as things are on these separate continents. So as things break apart, we, we continue with our evolutionary story. But, ooh, I'm not walking through time as fast as we should. So now, we come into the late Triassic. The dinosaurs now are some of the largest organisms that have ever walked on land. We have these sauropods, which we have a, a smaller version of them in our great hall. They got twice as big as Patty out there. Um, and we continue through this time period with um, all of these large organisms, and in fact, there's a thought that those large organisms interacting on the land, crushing things, eating all the plants, and doing all of that actually sent a lot of energy through waste and carbon into the oceans. And beginning in the Jurassic is a time period that we call the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. So from the Jurassic coming into the Cretaceous, we have a lot of diversification that happens in the ocean. A lot of organismal groups there 
because of various innovations that they develop in their reproductive um, capacities, but also in um, predatory and pr predator and prey interactions. Things in the, in the oceans become vastly different than we've ever seen before, and they explore different ways of protecting themselves in different forms. So we have a lot of change that happens at that time period. So coming into the Cretaceous is now the peak time of the dinosaurs. Everybody know their favorite dinosaur groups? Uh, these you kids over there, you know all your favorite dinosaur groups? Yeah, what are your favorite groups? Yeah, we're coming into that time period where we have the T-Rex, yes. So exactly, this is, this is where we have the continents are finishing breaking apart. We have all the big groups of the dinosaurs all over the world. A lot of great stories still being found today in fossil finds in South America and in China and in the American West. Um, so, and in the air we have flying reptiles and, fly, and birds. From the Jurassic into the Cretaceous, a lineage of dinosaurs the, becomes the feathered animals that we know of as birds. And so birds are alive at this point now, along with pterosaurs. So they're all competing for the air, and there's, there's insects in the air. Don't yet have bats. That comes later. But we have a lot of life teeming on this, on this surface. And it continues. But plants are innovating at this time. You start to have flowers. And with flowers comes a big change with insects. As all the flowers can change, you get insects that have all the different forms. And you lead to, actually to this day, insects are the most diverse animal that we have. Um, and so continuing through time, but we get to the end of the Cretaceous and we have a mass extinction. But here's all that life teeming. But the mass extinction that we talk about at the end Cretaceous, the big the killing off of the dinosaurs that we hear about. Dinosaurs didn't all die. The big ones did, but there's still 10,000 or maybe even as many as 18,000 species of, of dinosaurs. So that's, that's in birds. What happened at this end Cretaceous ex extinction? We have the big meteorite, the, the Chicxulub meteorite that hit near Mexico. And we talk about that being the end of the dinosaurs. Yes, the big dinosaurs ended, and this allowed mammals to take over, but the small dinosaurs, the birds, continued. And yes, we see a lot of things dying off on land during this time period at the end Cretaceous, but the stuff in the ocean wasn't bothered as much. So the end Cretaceous is a mass extinction of a certain kind. Because we see a lot of the changes that there are some things on the, on the, it, we did lose a lot of ocean shelf as sea level changed at this time period with all the continents spreading. We, the sea level rose during the Cretaceous. So that made for a lot of land, of inland seas for things to grow. And then as that changed and those sea level dropped, again, you lost the space for all those, the marine organisms to live. And so, yes, you did lose some marine organisms that lived in the shallows, but did that affect any of the marine organisms living out in the deep and the things that swam around? No. So, the Cretaceous is the story we all know and when all the dinosaurs died, but it's not the biggest extinction that we had. We already talked about that back at the Permian. That's the story that's really changing our whole planet. You know, the, all, all the different things, had something else survived in the Permian than what did, the history of our planet would be completely different. The Cretaceous history doesn't change things nearly as much as we think it did. Now, there was a little bit of a, so here we have, that's where that end Cretaceous extinction is, and we continue. Now, this chart that you've seen a couple times, I forgot to explain a couple things. Think back, the Cambrian, all those organisms that evolved, they died out at the end Permian. But all these organisms that evolved here, we still have some of those groups today, but they're not as plentiful as the groups that made it through and, and diversified through here. That's the, that's the Mesozoic fauna. And that's what our fauna is today. The mammals that are alive today, as we, oh sorry, I've, I'm actually up here now in time at 65 
million years. The, the things we have today are, are, are because of that time period. So now, our tree of life has grown quite large. We're through with our dying. Oh, sorry. I'm pressing the wrong button. And now we have the big mammal. Next thing that happens with these. So this is a time period where you still have some large birds, bigger than the ostriches we have now. But you've got some small mammals that are starting to get big. But you still got small horses. The scene that, that this time period makes me think about is terror birds hunting little tiny horses. You know, that's actually this image that is, always, that is what I see when I think of this time period. But we have these large mammals on land start to have grass, and that's a big innovation that changes things. And you end up with all of the grazers that we have. Climate changes through this time period. It's actually hotter at the beginning of the Cenozoic and gets cooler leading up towards our time period. Um, and, as a, and we start moving the continents further and further towards the story that we know today, to their location. You see in these pictures organisms that you might be familiar with and some that you're not, but they're all related to animals that we know today. It's also in this time period that from the elephant groups, from the from the bovine groups and, and the hippos, we have relatives that go into the sea and become whales and manatees and dolphins. And so, again, exploring those innovations. In this time period, we have a group of mammals, bats, make their way into the sky for flight. And in fact, they are the most diverse mammal group in all, of all mammals. So continuing through time, now we just have minor changes and adjustments in, re in, re in reaction to changes in climate. But nothing really is all that different. There are, there are, you can go to the beach and collect seashells of species that were alive at this time that are still alive today. And in fact, you find their shells together and you can use various analyses to know the age of those shells, but they are the same species. So we come further forward into time. Here's an image of, this, of kind of a grassland savanna. Grass was a major innovation. And, it, and in, in fact, one of the things about grass is it takes up the silica. And so the animals had to adjust for that because the grass is actually very damaging to teeth. And so those ungulates began to have to grow teeth in a different way to handle grazing on grass. And so we get to today, we have this. Uh, we have glaciers, and actually the ice ages we have are, are made, were enabled because Australia separated from Antarctica. The circumpolar current that circles Antarctica allows our oceans to cool and to get colder. If, Antarct if Australia was still here, it would have diverted that water back up towards the equator, and we would have a much warmer planet right now. So the oceans provide for a cooler planet. But, and so here's, the, here's more recent, our human ancestors would have known, interacted with these animals. It was cold, but, the, but this all is changing. We're still in that ice age. We're at the end of that ice age. But that is all changing because of the current changes in the climate that we are facilitating. All that coal that was, that was developed in the Carboniferous, that is now release, being released the carbon from that time period is being released in the atmosphere through our industrial uses. And so that's changing our climate. So as we go into, the, so pause, this is now our tree of life as we see today. All of these things, all the way back through time, from some initial single-celled organism. So here, going to the future, what changes do, does the future hold? As we go further through time, is this where we're going to end up? We're not going to be around for that. That's 250 million years in the future, potential for the, for the continent. But with that, I've talked about a lot of different things in your own time. You could um, figure out, you go look into a few of these topics. But we can see the interaction of the planet with life and our own interactions with the planet and the effects that it has on climate. And I think there's a lot of really interesting things that have happened throughout the history of life. And it makes for 
a lot of things, a lot of fun stories to be understood from the rocks and from looking at what life we have today and why is that what we see now. And thank you for your time. Let's give a big hand to Ryan for a great talk. And uh, he can stick around to take some questions now. Uh, and Ryan, if you don't mind repeating the question when you hear it. Sure. Uh, questions for Ryan, please. Any questions? All right, then, let's give another hand, and thank you so much for uh, coming tonight, today, rather.